Hello everybody, I hope this video finds all of you doing really well. You know, we are rapidly moving toward Easter, and Easter is a story of redemption and resurrection. It's a story of humanity's second chance, that God is a God who gives second chances because he's a God of love, and he loves his creation. There are many players in the Easter story, and today I'd like to talk about one person that we seldom look at in depth and ask ourselves why. And that is, why did Judas betray Jesus? You know, there might be a number of answers to it. I don't think I have all the answers, but I'd like to do a little exploring with you today to kind of come up with maybe what might be the answer to why Judas betrayed Jesus. We're going to look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. That's where uh, this story takes place. And as we do, just want to kind of explore what are the possibilities as to why Judas betrayed Jesus. We begin in Matthew 26. If you have your Bible with you, I'd love you to follow along. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. You might have a different version, but you know what? They're going to probably look pretty similar. So we're going to begin. Matthew 26, verse 6. This is what it says. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, and I want to pause there, and I want to explore that just a little bit. I don't want to skip over this simple verse because there's meaning to it and there's implication in it. You know, Jesus and his disciples have gone to the house of a leper, and the implications are um, that something's going to happen to them because they've come in contact with this leper. You know, by encountering Simon the leper, Jesus and his disciples would be considered unclean, ceremonially unclean. And being unclean would disqualify them from participating in normal religious worship services in the temple. So while they're at Simon's house, uh, a little bit of controversy arises, and it takes place in the next few verses. We continue on. Matthew 26, verse 7, this is what it tells us. A woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at table. You know, this would have nearly been scandalous. We're told in John's gospel that the woman was Mary. This is the same Mary who is sister to Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Matthew indicates that Mary poured the ointment on Jesus' head. But if we look at John's gospel, John indicates that Mary poured it on his feet, on the feet of Jesus, and wiped it with her hair. Now, both gospels are probably right. She probably poured it on his feet as well as his head. But this close, intimate contact between two unmarried people would have probably raised a lot of eyebrows at that time, and it's likely it would have started the flow of gossip. You know how things like that happen. So it was a little bit scandalous about what was going on at Simon the leper's house. Our story continues in the next two verses, Matthew 26, verses 8 and 9. This is what it says. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Again, John's gospel gives us deeper insights. The one who was upset was Judas. In fact, Judas says in John's gospel, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, a denarii was the equivalent of a day's wages at that time. So 300 denarii is practically a year's worth of wages, and that's what it costs for this ointment that Mary had brought to anoint Jesus with. And when I read this, I think there's some implications here. I think that Judas 
seems to be kind of at ease with calling out Mary for what he perceives to be this waste of this ointment in anointing Jesus. He's so at ease, it made me wonder if Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were part of the larger group of Jesus' disciples and followers. You know, Jesus had his 12. He had the apostles. Judas was one of them. But we're told in the scriptures that at another point, there was a larger group of 70 disciples that Jesus went out to minister as well. So I wonder if Judas uh, knew Mary, Martha, and Lazarus uh, kind of personally, because they too were disciples of Jesus. They weren't part of his inner 12, but they were followers of Jesus. So Judas doesn't seem to have any problem in calling Mary out over this. Now our story continues in the next few verses. Matthew 26, verses 10 through 12. This is what it tells us. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. So what we see here is that Judas castigates Mary, thinking she's wasting this ointment that costs a lot of money. And as Judas does that, Jesus turns around and he castigates Judas for attacking Mary's worship. You see, because that's what Mary was doing. Mary was worshiping Jesus. In fact, in John's gospel, Jesus says to Judas directly, leave her alone. You know, this must have been embarrassing for Judas to have Jesus call him out like that. I mean, for goodness sakes, he was one of Jesus's 12 intimate companions. It was almost as if Jesus was taking Mary's side and she was just a woman. And in that culture of the day, women were considered substantially less than men. I would imagine that's how Judas looked at Mary. Like, you know, she wasn't even supposed to kind of be there. So I've often wondered why Judas did what he did in betraying Jesus. You know what? I know it was part of God's plan. God knew all about Judas's heart. He knew that Judas's heart was wicked and would ultimately do something like this. Jesus knew that too, but it never stopped Jesus from inviting Judas to be one of his disciples. So I wonder if in Judas's mind, he's thinking something like this. You know what? Jesus seems to care more for a leper. He drags us into Simon's house. We become unclean and we can't participate in worship. Jesus seems to care more for this woman than he does for me. For crying out loud, I'm one of his special 12. I'm one of his hand-chosen guys. I wonder if this experience was Judas's last straw. He had had enough of life with Jesus. You know what? Sometimes God doesn't work the way that we think he should work. Sometimes others receive a blessing and we might be wondering, why don't I receive the blessing? Jesus shoots down Judas's argument for the money being given to the poor. And that must have been hard for Judas to hear and possibly an affront to Judas. You know, I don't know that any of us like being told that we're wrong, especially by God. I wonder if Judas thought to himself, I can't seem to do anything right. You know, John's gospel gives us insights that Matthew's gospel doesn't give us about this experience that Jesus had with Judas. John tells us that Judas really didn't care about the poor at all, but that he was a thief. John indicates that Judas had charge of the money bag or the treasury of Jesus and his disciples. And John tells us that Judas used to take what he wanted from that money bag for his own purposes. That's why he was a thief. You know, Judas received some kind of solace, some kind of comfort, 
some kind of meaning from helping himself to the money that was in the treasury. He was thinking that he was doing it secretively, but evidently others knew about it. You know, maybe this is why Judas is so upset that the ointment wasn't sold for 300 denarii by Mary. The money would have gone into the money bag where Judas would have had access to it. You know, I get some sense here that Judas's world as he knows it is contracting. It's shrinking. It's being squeezed. And it's beginning to kind of cave in on him at this point. Life isn't going the way that he thought it should go. Our story continues in the next verse, Matthew 26, verse 13, and this is what it says. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Well, in part of Jesus' castigating Judas, he says, Mary, Mary will become famous for what she has done in anointing him for his burial. She was anointing Jesus, preparing him for his death and his burial. And that's an integral part of the Easter story. Was this Judas' last straw? That this woman would be more famous, more significant than he ever was? You know what? We all search for significance in this life. Even those who seem to be the most successful. People like corporate CEOs, businessmen, businesswomen, actors, pastors, housewives, homeless people, athletes and doctors, nurses, chaplains, army captains, and even presidents and residents. We're all searching for significance. Judas was also. He was wanting to be a significant person. Our story continues in Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16. This is what it tells us. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. If Judas couldn't find significance with Jesus, he was going to find significance without Jesus. He attempts to garner recognition, fame, significance with the chief priests. You know, ultimately, we don't know why Judas betrayed Jesus. We don't know what his last straw was, but something led him to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And that's about $3,000 in today's money. You know, sometimes people are disappointed with God over how life has gone for them. Sometimes they feel let down, cheated, or have a sense that life has been unfair to them. Maybe Judas felt some of that. Maybe he felt all of that. I don't know. Judas wasn't the only one, though, to give up on Jesus when he decided to betray Jesus. He wasn't the only one to feel some disappointment with God, with Jesus. We see in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 53 through 67, others who felt some disappointment. This is what John's Gospel records. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And what Jesus was saying, he was saying something to the effect of, unless you are consumed by me and for me, you can't be my disciple. And in the next couple of verses, this is what it says. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? 
Simon Peter answered him, saying, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So Judas wasn't the only one to give up on Jesus. He wasn't the only one to turn his back on Jesus. In a sense, he wasn't the only one to betray Jesus. Whatever Judas' last straw was, it caused him to give up on Jesus, the one who had eternal life. Life can be hard at times. We can feel great disappointment. We can even feel great disappointment with God. We might get to the point to where we ask ourselves, what's the use or what's the point? But apart from Jesus, we'll never experience a fulfilled life. And we'll also never experience his eternal life. And that's what Judas missed out on. He wasn't fulfilled, and he wasn't going to experience Jesus' eternal life when he betrayed him. I wanted to say a prayer for all of you today. Would you join me in a prayer? Father, help us to stay close to you. We're so grateful for what Jesus did for us when he came into our world and died for the sins of the world. Father, help us to always love you deeply, love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, for you are the one who has eternal life, and we desire that eternal life. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you have a blessed Sunday, and I'll see you again next time.